Um, all right. My, well, my name is Thomas Vergao. I am the internal control officer uh, for the New York State Justice Center uh, and the current president of NYSICA. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to NYSICA's first event of 2023. Uh, a few housekeeping items up front. Um, there are two CPEs available today, uh, this afternoon. In order to receive full credit, please remain in attendance for the duration of the event. Uh, CPEs will be issued uh, to all eligible attendees within three weeks of uh, today's event. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to David Leather, uh, NYSICA Vice President, who will be introducing our speaker for this afternoon. David. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for our event. And I'd like to give a little background on Marlon. So Marlon Belogue provides financial advisory services, which include forensic accounting, fraud examination, internal control consulting, and review for small to mid-sized businesses, not-for-profit organizations, individuals, and trust estates with a focus of commercial and real estate litigations. Also, business disputes and matrimonial consulting. He has worked serving a variety of industries during his career uh, with Ernst & Young, Seavist Inc., and CBITS, Marks Peneth, as a forensic accountant and fraud examiner. And as and has been serving clients with the truth behind the numbers for over 10 years. Marlon is most effective due to a basic motto. The numbers don't lie, people do. And his work truly reflects the motto, which carries a non-biased approach to all engagements, effectively eliminating confirmation biases, illustrating effective demonstratives, which include simple to read graphs and charts, as well as robust expert reporting. Marlin's work products are effective in court, which display complex accounting and fraud schemes in an understandable format for both judge and jury. Please give a warm welcoming to Marlin as he will further discuss understanding corruption, bribery, and bid rigging, a hand-on-hand -hand dance. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dave. I sincerely appreciate the, the introduction there, and uh, you really covered all the bases. So welcome everyone. You have officially joined Understanding Corruption, Bribery, and Bid Rigging, which I call a hand-to-hand -hand dance. So just to skip over my own introduction, um, you know, we see off here to the right, the numbers don't lie, people do. Uh, this is something I go by on a day-to-day -day basis inside my investigations. And uh, each time I, I find this to be true. All right. So we have financial and forensic procedures where we could identify evidence and illustrate the story of each and every fraud uh, fraud scheme that we encounter. Okay, so today, though, uh, we'll be focused on a bribery and corruption as it relates to government agents associated with third parties, such as vendors. And we'll also go through some case studies and hopefully you are aware of some. But first, I'd like to get to know you as the audience, and this is something that I do with all of my students, uh, just so that I can understand their demographics. So I'll ask that you respond in the chat box, okay? So let's get to know you, all right? Just a quick background check on whether you know the definition of corruption. So I'll give you guys about 30 seconds or so, or to a minute, to choose the correct answer. All of the above is a very safe bet, but <laughs> all right, I see a lot of bees coming in. And let me just read these very carefully to you guys. Theft of assets that have already been, appeared on the victim's financial records, okay? The wrongful use of influence to procure and benefit for the actor or another person, contrary to the duty and rights of others. B is looking very healthy as your answers. All right, someone wrongfully obtains and uses another person's personal financial data for economic gain. Okay, and then the misuse of credit or debit card information to make purchases without the victim's authorization. So just to, you know, for anybody who chose other than B, you know, C and D are clearly going to be your identity theft issues. And uh, C, B has the influence to procure and benefit. The actor. All right, so let's go. The answer obviously here is B. So you guys did very well. <laughs> All right, the wrongful use of influence to procure a benefit for the actor or another person, contrary to the duty or the rights of others. Okay, so the very important definition, uh, the key word here is influence. 
Okay. In the chat box, I'd also like to know generally what city you are from or working for. Either one is okay. A lot of Albany, a couple of New York cities, great. Rochester, I like to see it. Binghamton, okay. Buffalo, good. I saw White Plains, good. New York City still. Long Island, welcome. The one person from Long Island. <laughs> All right, good. So we have a lot of uh, Albany, Syracuse, okay, Buffalo, Rochester, Long Island, New York City. Great, perfect. And then finally, just give me generally what your title is or your industry. I'm going to expect we're going to see a lot of auditors. <laughs> Great. Very good. A lot of them, mostly internal auditors, auditors, okay. Awesome, great. So most of you are auditors. Okay, <clears throat> awesome. So our agenda for today will start with the current environment. This will help, help uh, set our stage for the following topics. And we'll look at the types of corruption and elements of each. Uh, this section is purely designed to get our minds thinking about fraud and how it's committed. And we'll also then dive <clears throat> into bribery, all right, a mini case study, and then review the types of detection and prevention controls you guys can obviously use as the auditors. Okay. And since bribery and bid rigging are hand in hand, we'll then review those steps to bid rigging and then add onto that foundation of controls. Um, uh, for bid for bid rigging purposes, and then finally we'll take a look at the exploitation of the Buffalo Billion, a larger case study that includes all of the elements of of fraud, all of the elements uh, and vulnerability ingredients that I will present to you in later slides, and uh, we'll be able to identify each one as we review that case study. So that's going to be a fun case study as well. And uh, before we begin, and before we go on. Feel free to, of course, ask questions in the in your chat box during the presentation or even leave a comment that you believe is insightful. And this way we could discuss it as we go along. And if I can respond in a timely manner, I will try definitely do my best. Um, but if I don't, of course, please leave your question for the end as well if I don't get to it right away. Um, but let's keep this conversational. Let's be engaged. Um, and I'm looking forward to continuing. So here we go. So. I'm not trying to poke fun at bribery and corruption. This is a very serious topic, but we have to set the idea that this sort of act is never going to go away. Certainly, but certainly it can be mitigated. So with this slide, what should sink in, of course, is where there is power, influence and money. Certainly the temptation for corruption, bribery and scandals may surface. OK, <laughs> so in this slide, you can obviously see that I go back all the way to the Roman Empire. Right, the Caesar known as Caligula was one of the most ruthless leaders uh, documented in the Roman history, um, and he was known for the harshest of corrupt acts. Okay, so obviously I go that far back, but in American history, it's not so old in comparison, right? But an early example of of corruption uh, we could see is William Tweed, who was known as Boss Tweed. Okay, and the Democratic machine known as Tammany Hall. <clears throat> okay, here. He essentially utilized his wealth and power uh, to pay for votes among senators and bribed his way through legislation, passing laws that mostly benefited uh, the wealthy at the time. One of those laws, for instance, was um, there was a draft. Clearly, there was a draft during this time frame. And he was able to pass a law that said, well, if you're wealthy, you could pay $300 to a poor citizen to take your place in the draft. So during his time, that law stayed in place. And again, you know, where there's power and authority, there's often corruption. And by power authority, we're going to mean the ability to influence decisions. There's a word again to influence decisions and outcomes. Okay. So now that we understand it's not going to go away, okay, what happened more recently in New York State? And I date back, I go back about five years. So that to me is recent. Okay. So we have a, quite a few examples. 
Oh, that's interesting. And and, and uh, Shremus says that there are buildings still named after him to this day. Very interesting. And even knowing the history of what has happened. Okay. So we have a few examples that we're going to go through. And so first we're going to be, we're going to begin with Joseph Prococo. Okay. We'll look at this more in later slides as he's a part of our case study, uh, a part of the Buffalo billion case study, but what happened? Okay. So Joseph Prococo was the right hand of Andrew Cuomo. Okay. Joseph received bribe, bribes that came from COR Development, a construction company, CPV Energy, and LP Simonelli. Okay. These were companies that were able to win bids and maintain business with New York State. But in short, he promised time and meetings with Andrew Cuomo and other top officials and leads to shift those decisions and bids in favor of those companies. Okay. Much of the money, though, was paid by CPV Energy through lucrative job for Prococo's wife uh, that required little to no work. So essentially, the entity funded the bribes by a fictitious employment scheme. Okay. And looking at, and oh, apologies, and looking at this slide a little bit further. Okay. So it says here he accepted 320,000 known bribes and his position was executive deputy secretary. So obviously, his position had a lot of weight and influence, right? Being the right hand. He was only sentenced to six years in prison. Um, you know, controversial, you know, whether you think that that's enough time or if you required more time, we don't know. But also involved here, Elaine Calogero, Steve Aiello, Joseph Girard, Girardi, and Louis Simonelli, and a couple other individuals I did not list here, unfortunately. Okay. What happened to a question in the chat box? What happened to $320,000? We will get there surely in the case study. So just, just hold on tight to your seats. All right. So now we're moving on to Elaine Calogeros. Okay. He was also a top aide to Andrew Cuomo and the former president of SUNY Polytechnic Institute. This was also formerly known as CNCE. All right. So the bundle of work that he was a part of was known as the Buffalo Billion. Okay. Of the $850 million, $750 million was designated to a Tesla Panasonic solar panel manufacturing facility that was going to be overseen by CNCE. So we'll see this in a later slide. I illustrate it quite uh, a little bit more easier for us to, to visualize. All right. But he was charged with two counts of wire fraud, one count of wire fraud conspiracy. All right. So noting that these charges, he only received three and a half years in prison and was released. And similar individuals in the same corruption ring, you see Steve Aiello, Joseph Girardi of Core Development, not listed here is um, LP Simonelli and those individuals. And then we have Sheldon Silver, 2015. Uh, he has since deceased, uh, but he was also noting, note his role here, former leader of the New York State Assembly. He accepted about $4 million in bribes. And the most important thing here is look at the charges, two counts of honest services, wire fraud, two counts of honest services, mail fraud, two counts of extortion under the color of light of official right, one count of engaging in illegal monetary transactions. And he received the harshest out of everybody listed here today. He actually received two sentences, 12 years and 10 years. And obviously $4 million probably got him to those two sentences. Okay. Dean Skelos, also former New York State Senate leader, again, another position of power and influence. He accepted about $300,000 of bribes and secured a, an employment position for his son. All right, but again, looking at the charges here, conspiracy to commit extortion under the official right, conspiracy, conspiracy to commit honest services fraud, three counts of extortion under color of official right, and three counts of soliciting and receiving bribes. So you're going to hear these type of charges over and over again. These are, it's almost cookie cutter, okay? Pamela Harris is a little bit different. Now, she didn't receive bribes, okay? But she did something else in a position of influence and power, okay? But she pled guilty to four felonies after prosecutors had charged Harris with fraudulently pocketing $25,000 from the Federal Emergency Management Agency and $23,000 in New York City funds that were meant for Coney Island Generation Gap. This was a not-for-profit that she herself uh, created and, uh, and led. Now, 
this is almost twofold here. So you have an individual in a position of power and authority who has access to cash, okay? So she embezzles the $25,000 for herself, and she also further embezzles $23,000, right? Guided towards her not-for-profit, and instead, to add insult to injury, she doesn't use it for the benefit of the generation gap, the not-for-profit. She instead continues to instead pocket that money. So the, 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 the corruption or the greed can go further. It's not, it's one or two steps, it can continue. And finally, we come to even more recently, we know uh, Kathy Hochul's former Lieutenant Governor. So Senator Brian Benjamin resigned after he was arrested and indicted in connection with campaign finance schemes on charges including bribery and falsification of records, okay? As of today, I don't have the totals for you of approximate damages or bribes, but I can also update everybody <clears throat> Um, after 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 today, hopefully we will get an update. But clearly, just in New York State alone, politics can be quite dirty. And if we looked across the United States, I'm certain we can find hundreds of thousands more examples just in the last five to eight years alone. All right, so that brings us to our next slide. All right, this is corruption by state, but really it's corruption convictions per capita, okay? So here we have a statistic that shows corruption convictions per capita. The key here, though, is the word convictions, of course, right? That's how we understand this, this statistic. This does not mean, then, that if you look at the top states here, Wyoming, Vermont, and Alaska, that they are the most corrupt. But utilizing the, the title corruption convictions per capita, we understand that that they were instead able to identify and convict fraudulent behavior, okay? So it doesn't mean that they're the most corrupt, but that they were able to identify and convict. Exactly, exactly, Ignacio. They were the ones that were caught, okay? And that's a very important uh, differentiator here when we're looking at statistics, all right? So here, the slide then indicates, and if we're looking at the bottom portion of the same statistics, indicates that New York State is the quote unquote least corrupt by convictions by the statistic, right? Again, though, this has to be taken with a great amount of salt because we're focused on identifying, detecting, and in this instance, convicting these frauds, okay? So what we can infer further from these statistics is that there are also weaknesses in several states to detect and prevent fraudulent acts by government officials, right? So we're gonna get into this a little bit more in later slides, and we'll speak more about the environment um, that can influence bribery and corruption, okay? So this is very interesting though to know, all right? New York, California, and Florida apparently have the least amount of convictions. So let's go to polling question number one. If you've been listening so far, thank you. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna look at this question here. So in the chat box, once again, Based on the previous slide, which three states had the most corruption convictions per capita? Good, good. Very happy that everybody's getting, you know, unless you guys are just copying off the previous person, <laughs> but everybody seems to see D in the response here, so that's great. Yeah, so Wyoming, Vermont, and Alaska were apparently the states that were able to detect and convict these frauds. All right, and that's right here. That shows it right here, so D is your correct answer. All right, good job, everybody. All right, so again, so in this next section, all right, we're gonna look at types of corruption schemes, mainly focused on two categories here. Okay, we're gonna look at bribery, and we're also going to look at bid rigging, okay? And then we'll introduce to my, in, I'll introduce to you my vulnerability ingredients for government corruption. All right, these are ingredients that, uh, through research, I've noticed that these particular elements exist in each uh, fraud scheme, okay? And then we'll revisit, if you know the fraud triangle, we'll revisit the fraud triangle, and then I add an update to it because it's about time. I believe that we we take effect and noticing the environment in which we live today. So here, 
All right. So there are several types of bribery bribery schemes. All right, that we can note here, and we'll talk a little bit about each one. Uh, but let's go through them starting at twelve o'clock. Okay, kickbacks are the most common types of bribery you will witness. Okay. Other forms of kickback will be diversion and overbilling, moving to your right. All right. But we'll focus today purely on the original form, which is kickbacks and direct bribery payment. And after we're done looking at kickbacks, of course, and how to prevent them, we'll also take a look at the bid rigging. Okay. So at six o'clock, we see that bid rigging can take place in three stages, right? In the pre-solicitation phase, the solicitation phase, and the submission phase. And we'll look closer at, at the much larger case study later on with the Buffalo Billion on how all of this comes together and why we call this a hand in hand dance, right? One cannot exist without the other. You will always see them together. And not listed on this slide, though, of course, is economic extortion and illegal gratuities, though those elements also appear in our case study. All right. So here we come to my vulnerability ingredients. OK, so what are they? I define these as factors again that exist when a government official has considered to take part in fraudulent behavior. And time and time again, we see these occur. So let's start with trustworthy. OK, individuals that we voted in or are appointed by those that we trust directly received trust. OK, often when there is a veil of trust, this trust can be exploited, leading to unlawful and ethical, unethical behavior. For example, favors are easily performed among government officials and also between vendors. It could be one friend in government asking another friend in government to sign off on a document. OK, so with trust, we assume the document, right? If we trust someone, we're assuming that the document already has been verified, reviewed and considered at other levels of approval. Right? So if you're approached, you assume that it has already gone through. This is known as confirmation bias. So this is clearly unethical, whether by mistake or not, and they break from protocol. But we exhibit confirmation bias, ignoring certain red flags because of trust. Okay, so we're influenced to believe that something is correctly done because of trusting in other people. Right? So right below this, we have positions of influence. Okay. All right, so this can be a leading official, a procurement officer, a board of director. Right? These individuals will either have the direct authority to make decisions or the ability to influence the decision of others. Right? So whether I can issue a check or if I have to ask someone else to issue a check, if I'm in a position of power and influence, more likely that person requested to issue the check will do it because I am trusted. Let's move on. Moving to the right, of course, we have undisclosed conflicts of interest. A procurement officer, for instance, and individuals with the authority to appoint and influence work can cause diversion of business to friends, family, and other unethical vendors, right? For those that built a relationship with the procurement officer, okay? Of course, though, we have personal financial pressures, okay? Moving more to the right. So this does not mean individually uh, that they simply are in need of money, right? But sometimes it could also mean keeping up with, you know, the Instagram Joneses at this point, right? Uh, it is like a priority for this person, a lavish lifestyle, maybe tempting new cars, businesses, right? Wanting to impress others also describes that of personal financial pressures. And finally, we have political motives, right? Individuals who have political goals tend to want to increase the number of accomplishments under their leadership and will often place individuals as leads of projects Right and be hands off. Right? So the monitoring and oversight on how things get done. Right? Are no longer are no longer in in work. Right? So oversight and monitoring here is foregone for personal benefit. That's a key point. So now that we understand the vulnerability ingredients, right? And how they come together. They can also be seen right with the fraud triangle. So the late, if you're familiar with it, you know that the late Donald Cressy created the fraud triangle by surveying fraudsters in prison. Okay. And what he found with this survey and questioning of, of these fraudsters was that pressure, opportunity, and rationalization, these three elements always existed within fraud schemes. Okay. 
but <clears throat> with this update in today's culture, though, we see that environment will play an even larger role in an individual's decision making. Okay, you might be asking yourself, what is the difference between rationalization and environment? Right? Rationalization, though, is often a short term excuse. For instance, everyone is doing it. I deserved a raise. They owed me money. I used it for a good cause. My mom just had surgery. So these are all short term reasons as to why someone would commit their initial fraud. Okay. But environment, on the other hand, explains that it is more long term. What environment built and shaped the individual and their core beliefs and their ethics to decide whether or not to commit the fraud. Okay. So while we have the temporary short term excuse, that is literally just a trigger to the gun, right? The gun itself is your environment. All right, let's go for it for instance. Okay, so for instance, is the individual in an environment that emphasizes ideas of success through luxury goods, right? Or services? Are the friends and professional groups they are a part of involved in or say or do corrupt things together? Okay, this is why our previous slide, in our previous slide, we note that financial pressures and political motives are also a result of our environment. Okay, so it all comes together slowly. But these factors will generally promote wrongdoing, especially among those who are capable of colluding and forming inappropriate relationships. So finally, next polling question number two. Okay, get ready. I'll read this. I'll read this to you guys. An individual in a position of influence has considered their mounting debt. They offered to accept services of a friend friend's company if they were willing to share a taste of the profits. This person is under the influence of which element of the fraud triangle? I'll give you guys 30 seconds or so. I like the person, whoever said C and D, I like you. <laughs> I actually, I actually really like some of the mixed answers here that everybody is giving B, D, B, C, D. It's a, so it all incorporates a little bit of the, you know, the question is kind of uh, <laughs> incorporates a little bit about everything, but mainly here, right? You're going to focus on an individual in a position of influence. Okay. Has considered their mounting debt. So the trigger here is their mounting debt, right? That places C pressure. And for the person that said C and D, I appreciate you because you realize that he in the environment in which they are in, they were able to be pressured to create or form a fraud with someone else. So, so that's great. And obviously, those who have also said B, you're not wrong. It's the the better answer here is C. But B for people who said B, uh, yes, they are in a position of influence, and so they are able to have the opportunity to commit fraud. But good job all around. Uh, next slide obviously shows C as your correct or best answer for this particular scenario. But good job all around. All right, so now we're gonna get more into the nitty gritty of things. And this is, this is gonna be a little boring. This is gonna be more learning, okay? So for some of you, again, this is an introduction to bribery and corruption. And maybe for some of you, this is just a refresher course. But now we're gonna look at bribery. We're gonna look at kickbacks and a mini case study. Um, so let's go. So what is a kickback? All right, kickbacks involve the collusion between employees and vendors. All right, so this is very important right here. The, the key word is collusion, okay? And with my research, right, that I've done, um, I've, I've done extensive research on mostly looking at school districts, right? So we have to look at the procurement process. Why? Because the most common scenario that I was able to identify was that of the following. An employee and a vendor in the school district collude to defraud the school district. Okay. A vendor for the school district submits an inflated invoice for products or services rendered. Okay. And finally, the school just pays the inflated invoices, not realizing that something has occurred. 
Okay. So what are the damages though in this scenario? So that is the question you should ask yourself. Great, we got the services rendered. What happened, right? Why is this why is this a problem, right? A lot of people could start to rationalize certain behavior by certain officials, right? Because at, at, a, at a higher level, you don't see the damage, but what are the damages here? So there are three ways in which the school district is harmed from this kickback, okay? So it's likely that inferior goods, inferior goods have been provided instead of the quality promised, all right? So that's one. Two, the vendor often does provide a smaller quantity of goods or services, all right, delivered. And or the invoices are inflated compared to other legitimate vendors. So it causes the school district to overpay for goods and services that are either inferior or in lesser quantity. So there are ways in which we are damaged. All right, so this is a little bit of a mouthful, but we're gonna read this together a little bit, and then we'll, this is our mini case study, all right? And then I'll depict for you guys and I'll illustrate the truth behind the numbers, right? The numbers don't lie, people do. So here we have Dinopoli, a former Hempstead school official and local restaurateur indicted in kickback scheme, right? So already we know that she has held a, a position of influence, right? Former director of food services. What does that mean? She is the procuring officer for the Hempstead Public School, okay? And um, so we have here, as alleged, Miss Sharon Gardner and Miss Maria Caliendo engaged in a scheme in which Miss Gardner steered more than $1 million in source, sole source school breakfast contracts to Miss Caliendo's company. So it seems as though Miss Sharon and, and Maria have already a relationship garnered, right? They, they've already created this relationship and now they've colluded to obtain $1 million worth of contracts. So in exchange, Miss Caliendo illicitly paid more than $100,000 in kickbacks to Miss Gardner which she then used to purchase a variety of personal luxury goods. Okay, so today's, and then we'll skip that part, but, I, but here it says, instead of following the legitimate bidding process for a food service contract, the defendants allegedly use the school district you know, as their own piggy bank. All right, so that was a mouthful, but essentially what you should understand here is that we have an individual of influence, Ms. Sharon Gardner, the former director of food services, Right, and they vendor Maria Caliendo colluding to take on one million dollars of contracts. All right, so this is the scheme. All right, so this is pretty straightforward. This is uh, generally what your kickbacks will look like. Okay, you have the individual Sharon Gardner, director of food services, at the top here. Right, she utilizes her position of influence, right, and authorizes the one million dollars worth of contracts. Okay, Maria Caliendo, her friend and vendor will then, once when she receives this payment, provide the $100,000 worth of kickbacks, okay? So this very, just, this breaks it down very simply. Your eyes can read this. It's literally a circle. And if we put the word repeat up here, this is how it just continues on and on and on. Anytime we're renewing a contract, we just put the, a button here, well, repeat, and the whole thing starts all over again. Maria Caliendo becomes the preferred vendor for the school district and nobody's going to look at it, okay? Because she has the authority to authorize these, this contract. All right, but let's, let's make our lives even more complicated and look at the process instead, right? So as an auditor, you want to depict and illustrate what exactly is happening, okay? So, if, so we look at here, if, if an employee can authorize a payment, such as Sharon Gardner in this scenario, the check is immediately cut to the vendor, and once received, the kickback is then issued directly to the government. Okay, so we have here, if you look again, Sharon Gardner. So if we can self-approve, right, this payment, it goes immediately down to issuing the check. And once received, the kickback is then made. But okay, oh, apologies. But let's look again now. If we go down the middle, we're going to make our lives a little complicated. What if Sharon Gardner couldn't? authorize the check or payment to the vendor. So there's two ways to do this or in, in coordination of these two items. You force a subordinate to create the order. Why? Again, you're in a position of trust. You say to a subordinate, I would love you to create this purchase order for me. And then instead of bringing it to the authorizing individuals or parties, 
you forge their signatures instead. Okay. And then therefore the, the check can be issued. And again, a kickback is then received. All right. So I see a question about red flags. Well, this is sort of like that. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about red flags and we're also going to talk about the controls that should exist, right? To prevent kickbacks. All right. And we're going to add on to that. And then we're also going to add on even more when we get to bid rigging. So we will be looking at some red flags. Okay. But this is what I call the foundational controls. Okay. And these mimic the billing scheme. All right. But so we have here separation of purchasing. We have authorization. All right. Receiving storing goods, cash disbursement controls. Uh, we have to maintain an updated vendor list, of course, and then proper matching of invoices and receiving reports. Now, this is just the foundation. All right. We're going to get even more complicated if we want to deter or at least detect and prevent kickbacks. Okay. So this is just your foundation, these six. So let's add on 12 more beautiful <laughs> internal controls. All right. So let's look at red flag number one or control number one. All right, a comparison of invoices from beginning to the most recent. All right, so often we will see that vendors will increase their price over time in order to cover the cost of kickbacks. All right, this is often a red flag that will require further investigation. All right, well, let's look at number two. Complementary to the first, okay, we have to ensure that there is a comparison to current market rates as well. So, or if within the victim entity, similar suppliers do exist, you have to also consider comparing these invoices to other vendors as well. Ensuring, so for instance, if we're looking at construction projects that exist and one seems to be a bit too high, why don't we look at other similar size construction projects and ensure that they're at least within a reasonable range, okay? So here we go, oh, apologies. So here we go, number three, consider a range of increase at the outset, right? And that will be an initial red flag, all right? So with time, the percentage increases will begin to grow and eventually become a multiple of the original cost as vendors will continue to consider covering the cost of kickbacks, okay? So what does this mean? So at first, at the outset of a project, the price seems pretty low and, and we're happy with that. But over time with change orders or, or increases in invoices, you'll see that the vendor becomes emboldened and wants to cover the cost of kickbacks, okay, to the government official. Let's look at price thre thresholds, number four. So price thresholds should be established as well so that any deviation from the price threshold require additional investigation or appropriate approvals, okay? So if we have a reasonable range of price, if, any, there, if there's any deviation between 5% or 10%, you might want to consider why and, and conduct an investigation. Number five here says maintaining an updated vendor list. Okay, so obviously this is necessary as perpetrators of fraud can utilize old vendor names, okay, or similar names to process payments. That is a very typical scheme that we see often. And those involved in the procurement process with access to these older vendor lists may also add additional unapproved vendors, okay? So, and finally, number six, consistent overstock supplies often are red flags or overbilling and inflated items. Okay, so if you're seeing that items and inventory are constantly being set, though you have an entire closet full of products, you know, you might want to consider what's going on here. Why are the invoices being sent increasing? And on a monthly basis, we're receiving more than what we need. Okay. If you didn't have enough yet of those six, okay, we have six more to go, okay? So again, <laughs> all right, missing products, number seven. All right, so missing products or services cannot be confirmed or rendered, right? Uh, that must be investigated if products and services are not provided. All right, so if, you, if you've paid someone already, right, to provide you a product and it doesn't show up within the month, right, or services weren't rendered, you have to investigate, all right? Or if you are a part of the decision-making process and notice these things are not occurring, then consider investigating others as well. If they say that uh, a service has actually been provided to you, find confirmation of the services rendered, okay? 
always provide supporting documentation. And then we're going to continue. Number eight, inferior products or services were provided, right? Again, another red flag. If the school district purchased hardwood desks, right, for the students, and yet they ended up with plastic chairs and plastic desks, obviously the invoice product doesn't match the actual service rendered. So again, another red flag that you might want to look out for. Another example is during construction, you requested marble slabs and you consider that these are actually granite slabs that look like marble, okay? So you're receiving an inferior good, you're receiving an inferior product to what you actually paid for, okay? What about ongoing comparison, number nine? Ongoing comparison uh, for actual expenditures versus budget. <clears throat> if a project is on course of being over budget or is over budget, okay, these differences have to be investigated, okay? So as a project is going, monitor the expenses closely in comparison to your budget. Okay, number 10, consider having an independent third party review the contract, okay? So someone unrelated to the procurement process should actually do a review of everything that is occurring during this process. And this way, this could avoid confirmation bias and detect certain red flags, all right? And every contract should have a, number 11, a right to audit clause, okay? This clause will allow the government entity to review the financials, receipts, and invoices of vendors to detect or prevent fraudulent behavior, right? Or being taken advantage of. And finally, of course, this is always a go-to uh, control here to have, but government officials, employees, and agents require it on an annual basis and signing of a training related to ethics with a focus on bribery and corruption, as well as red flags to be aware of. Okay, so I understand that these 12 were a handful, and we're actually gonna add six more when we, when we get to bid rigging. But nonetheless, these are necessary items here. So is corruption common? Yeah, you bet. So no matter what you do, right, if you do a Google search or, you know, for New York State fraud or United States fraud, anything, you will constantly get new and current um, headlines every single day. So none of this is uncommon. It's actually more common than we think. So let's go to polling question number three. All right. I know we slowed down a little bit with the internal control recommendations, but let's just go ahead into number three. All right. And take a small break here. Collusion leading to kickbacks target which process? Wow, um, Amy, very fast. Oh, who was the first one? Whoever that was, you are very fast at reading. Right, right. Obviously, number three, right? We're talking about procurement. We're talking about collusion with vendors, right? Building inappropriate relationships with others, right? That often always ha happens with the procurement. A lot of you are also saying C solicitation. That's actually a really good. That's actually a really good point to be made. But in this particular instance, right, collusion usually happens uh, with with uh, procurement, right? Solicitation. We'll actually go through that with bid rigging, and you'll understand why D is a better answer than C in this in this moment. All right. So of course, all right. So you had letter D. So good job. All right. So now we're going to get even more involved with bid rigging. All right. Um, let's see here. So we're also going to look at the necessary controls. Again, we're going to add on to our foundational controls and we're also going to look at how it occurs. All right. So let's have some more fun. All right. So the ideal, let me go through this process though. First, right? We have to understand the bidding process first in order to understand how it could be um, manipulated. All right. So again, an introductory course, I hope that you guys are uh, getting a feel for how this can happen, okay? So the ideal bidding process has three phases, okay? As I mentioned earlier, we have the pre-solicitation phase, the solicitation phase, and the submission phase, all right? So in the pre-solicitation phase, uh, you know, we're determining the contract terms, the vendor requirements, what type of vendors fit this type of project, okay? And so we'll, we'll consider that. In the solicitation phase, of course, it involves advertising those bids so that we can get a level playing field 
and entertain hopefully a healthy amount of competitors, right? So that would be the most ideal environment. We send out a solicitation and advertising a particular project or service needed, and we want a healthy amount of individuals. But a healthy amount of competitors can also indicate a red flag, and I'll and I'll get there in just a second. But and finally, we have phase three, right? The submission phase. All right, this allows vendors to submit their bids with respect to contract terms. Okay, and the selection process process then takes place. All right. So this is the ideal bidding process. If all goes well and nobody interferes, we should have a healthy, competitive bidding environment. That's not always the case, of course, and that's why I'm here today. All right, so let's look at these two items here. All right, so in the pre-solicitation phase, all right, you have these two schemes. You have the need recognition scheme, right? And then you have specification schemes. So. Keep an, keep an open mind as to how these items can occur, right? So here we say for need recognition, an employee colludes with a vendor, right? To convince the to be victim or the government agency that a product or a project is needed. Okay, so in this scenario, you could say, um, if I was a government agent or a person uh, that can have influence among other individuals, I would say I, I need, you know, we need new desks uh, for the students. They're falling apart or whatever. And I had a friend, you know, it just so happens that is running, uh, you know, a school supply company who can procure for us those items. All right. So I would make this need. I may say that these desks are breaking down. They're dangerous. They're not good. Um, you know, they're taking up too much space. We have more students coming in next year. We need to get smaller, but more durable desks. Great. So I've now caused an urgency, right, with the person above me or next to me, right? I've created this urgency in a sense of need, right? We need these items, okay? So that's how that scheme usually plays out in the pre-solicitation phase. You're causing a need that will create an opportunity for you to then approach your friend, okay? Well, we also have specification schemes, okay? A bribe is made to the government official to make the contract specific to the strengths and specific supplier of a vendor. We're gonna see this play out, of course, also in the Buffalo Billion case study, right? Um, but this is very this is a very a common way of obtaining kickbacks and and uh, manipulating the bid rigging process, right? So if we if we know that our friend has say 500 employees, is a large school uh, school supply um, vendor, okay? We will and everybody else around us, say in the Albany County region, all right, are smaller than he is. So I will do, I will create an RFP, right, a request for proposal. I will create the RFP to only specifically specifically be for large uh, school suppliers, okay, because I know everybody else is small. So the, then that would mean that my my friend would be the only one to win that bid. So that's so with need recognition and you know with specific uh, specification schemes we're able to start building on the bid rating okay but let's look at what happens in the solicitation phase as well we have bid pooling all right and this is a process by which several bidders conspire to split up contracts and ensure that each gets a certain amount of work all right so the vendor decides in advance what their bids will be all right uh, so they can guarantee that each vendor will win a share of the contract. This is extremely true and very common among uh, construction companies. All right. So if you look at a construction company, um, a CEO or wh whomever, right, people are posi uh, in positions of influence, we all get together. All right. And we say, well, here's a project with the government. Right. So let's get together and just determine what's a budget that we want. Right. And what ends up happening is one of us will decide to win the bid, right? We'll come a little bit under, we'll be very competitive, but nonetheless, the person that wins that bid, right? will then subcontract <laughs> the rest of our other contractors in the area, right? So that everybody has a share in this government fund, in this government project. So it's very easy to get away with this. This actually recently, I think, uh, you know, five or six years ago, also happened in Brazil. I believe with oil companies. So this is a very common way of, of winning bids and then sharing in profits. Okay, but let's look at fictitious suppliers. 
to eliminate competition in the solicitation phase of the selection process is to solicit bids from fictitious suppliers. So remember when I said I want a healthy bidding environment? So assuming that you receive a lot of bids, you think that there's a lot of suppliers out there or a lot of people uh, vying for these projects. But really what's happening is one or two or three individuals are getting together, creating fake LLCs, and then submitting bids that are drastically over budget, right? So it turns out that at, at the end of the day, my company or my friend's company will win that bid, okay? And that's why you flood, right, the bidding process with fictitious accounts. So that's another interesting way. And finally, the submission phase, which is also a huge red flag, right? It's called the last bid, the last bid scheme, okay? And what essentially happens here, an unethical vendor will bribe or provide kickbacks to the employee that has access to sealed and confidential bids, right? And then provides that bidding information to the unethical vendor. So, right, so the vendor has access to individuals that know confidential information. And once when they create these relationships, pay off for more information, right? So at the end of the day, what you're looking for here is, is the last bid always winning, right? Pattern recognition, is the last bid always winning these contracts? Okay, and that would indicate, you know, that there is some sort of collusion occurring within this bid rigging, within this bidding process, okay? So again, getting back into controls because we are auditors, okay? So we had our billing scheme controls, which was the foundation for our kickback scheme controls. But now that we have both billing scheme controls, we could add on our kickback scheme controls. This creates the bid rigging foundation. So no, I will not go through the you know 18 controls all over again. <laughs> I will save you that time. But just know that your billing scheme controls plus your kickback scheme controls will be your just your foundation alone, right? To now prevent and detect bid rigging. Okay, so luckily there's only eight, not 12, but nonetheless, let's get through these as well together. Okay, so consideration of unusually high contract prices, number one, right? So when vendors submit their bids, consider the budgeted expectations in comparison, in comparison to those submitted for bid, right? So if history shows that, I don't know, I want to create a storage facility, right? Um, it might cost, you know, $50,000 for the slab, and then we're going to get another $50,000 just for the metal building. Okay, so that brings us to $100,000. If history dictates, that's normally what it is. But then we send out the RFP, and it turns out people are saying, you know, the vendors, the competitors are saying, well, no, it's $250,000, it's $300,000. All right, we're going to get a little curious as to why in, in the past few years it was only $100,000, 100, okay? And... And, and we'll investigate further because what's gonna end up happening is the lowest bid will then essentially still be overinflated, but they'll win that bid, okay? So number two, very similar in manner, winning low bids lead to change orders, okay? So once work has commenced, if a vendor submits various change orders, such as, you know, such items should be investigated further, right? So, so say the lowest bid bids again, Okay, you get the lowest bid, and uh, again, it's a construction, and there's and they're saying, oh well, we have to do this and we have to do that, and they're submitting change orders. Okay, most likely the other bids have contemplated the actual necessity of the project, but when someone comes in low, you might also be concerned that the change orders, right, could be another way of receiving um, funds. Okay. What about large variances, right, between winning bids and other suppliers? Okay, so here's another red flag, number three. Okay, so say, for example, you have 10 bids, you know, and eight out of 10 bids come in at $1 million. So eight out of 10 come in 1 million or more. Okay, and then the other two bids come in at $750,000 and, you know, roughly $925,000. So those two look kind of good if, you know, if we're, if we're looking to get the lowest bid, right? You can assume that more likely the lower bid may win in this situation, okay? So again, pattern recognition, is the lowest bid always winning as well? And why is that? Are the other eight fictitious? 
Are they colluding, right? Is this another bid pooling situation that we're having? All right. So you always have to consider the types of schemes that can occur in bid rigging, right? In the bidding process, the types of schemes that can occur in bid in the bidding process in order to understand how to test and investigate. Okay. So what about number four? The last bid wins, right? So again, it's that last bidding, it's the last bid win scheme, right? So consider a pattern recognition though during the bidding process and winners over a period of time for similar projects. So Say again, I go back to construction because that's my favorite, right? So say in the past three years, we've had maybe 15 different construction projects. Well, do a, do a quick study. Look at who won these uh, construction projects over three years. Were they the last bit? Are they always the same individuals and people? This is a very important question to ask yourselves when auditing or look investigating the bid rigging process. All right. <laughs> There's four more here. All right. I promise these are very important though. So let's look at the rotation of wins. All right. Another pattern recognition, I would say. All right. So if you do a study, right, consider a time frame that includes similar projects. Okay. Like I said before, past three years, construction projects. Okay. So a ring of vendors could decidedly collude and allow others to win bids in, in a pattern, right? So again, let me give you another example. Five of us get together, okay? Or six of us because it's same size as dice, okay? So five of us get together, okay? And uh, we say, you know what? Uh, let's all sit around the table and each one will always win a bid in succession pattern. Or we could say, let's just roll the dice and anybody who wins the dice roll wins this contract as well, right? Given that we are also subcontractors on that same bid on the same contract, right? So in one instance, you'll have a pattern that you could recognize. And then in the second instance, where they're just rolling the dice, you won't necessarily have a pattern, but you could see that these individuals are often the winners, okay? So is three years sufficient to determine a study of patterns? So my answer to this is depends on the amount of projects you're looking at, okay? So if, if three years you've had about 40, 45, 47, 50, I don't know. If you have a decent number there to create a case study or an investigation, then you could be comfortable with saying three years is enough. But say you're a smaller municipality and you probably have one or two construction projects a year or a little bit more than that, right? You might wanna even go back a little further, right? To determine whether there's a longstanding pattern of, of the winners. And this doesn't necessarily, for those instances, I have to say that this doesn't necessarily mean that there is an issue, but what you can say is maybe there's less competitors and we need to open our reach to other areas, right? If you don't have a, a healthy enough competitive bid. All right, where did we leave off? <laughs> okay, number six, losers are subcontractors on winning bids. All right, again, this is this is goes with, everything here goes hand in hand with the corruption, all right? With bid rigging, right? So, like I said, in construction, right, you'll have, right, the losers being the subcontractors on construction projects. It's very straightforward. All right. Number seven, consider the vendor's existence, right? So, again, like I said, if you have a very healthy bid uh, bidding process and you see a lot of vendors coming through, right, just consider taking a handful or a sample of these vendors and doing some research, okay? You can see if an LLC was registered yesterday, two days ago, last week, a year ago, how old are they? Are they actually in business, right? Are they doing construction projects that aren't related to government, right? You can find out whether these individuals, <laughs> good job, Gabe, <laughs> it's okay, don't worry. Uh, you could see whether or not these individuals, of course, are real, or individuals or entities are real bids, okay? And once when you determine that, you could eliminate them or restart the process, okay? Finally, number eight, failure to advertise. This is another great way of, of ensuring that your vendor is the one that is chosen, right? So here you'd see that there are going to be a low number of bids, okay? And this is mostly an internal failure where the bid is not properly listed or advertised to the vendor list or on a public forum, okay? 
Uh, so therefore, the smaller the smaller than usual outcomes of bids is a major red flag. Okay. So we got through those eight. I, I if for those who are still listening, thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right, but that was tough. So here we are again at polling question number four. All right, and I'm gonna try to speed up because we have to get to the bitter the bigger um, uh, case study here. Okay. Okay, so the question here is, would fictitious suppliers be difficult to detect? Uh, we could review the history of a company, right? Yeah, exactly. So, like I said, so if you take a handful, a case study, if you will, during the bidding process, if you've already received a number of bids, try to take a few of those companies, right? Say if you have 20 bids, take maybe five, a random selection of five or six, okay? That's, a, that's about a healthy quantity. And you can look up their EINs, you can look up their LLC names, you can find out when they were registered, when they were created, do they have online presence? Okay, so think like an investigator instead and say, are these real vendors, right? And this shouldn't take more than, you could probably get through five or six within less than an hour. And this will save the, the, the city, the officials, those in position of, and, and, you know, in, in, of, of decision making, this will save them from, you know, pie in the face, right? We accidentally fell, uh, you know, fraud, you know, victim to a fraudulent bidding scheme. Okay, so again, take that hour, look it up, um, and it's all public information, of course. Okay, all right. So let's go to polling question number four. So which of the following is not a preventative measure of bid rigging? So I made this. Maybe this is more complicated. Hopefully, I made this question more complicated. Um, three of these are you know, preventative controls, and the other one is actually a way of um, bid rigging. All right, so I guess I'm, I guess I, I either, either I'm a good teacher, or you guys can see the next slide, or you guys are just all answering the same answer. So it's, it's one of those three. Right. Okay. So I don't have to go any further here. So you guys are all very right here. So narrow and specific vendor qualifications is a way in which corrupt agents and vendors are able to manipulate the bidding process. Right. So this is a, a manipulation scheme. Okay. The vendor requirements specifically describe the vendor's business as opposed to its competitors. Right. So we're looking to cookie cutter the RFP, right, to specifically design for our our vendor, our colluded, uh, our collusion relationship, right? That's what we're looking, that's exactly what we're looking at. So good job, everybody in the chat, good job. So finally, with a breath and a drink of water. All right, we get to the exploitation of the Buffalo Billion. All right, so we're gonna look at this at a very high level. Um, I'm gonna do my best to show you the environment though. So what I want you guys to understand we're not going to go into 100% detail of how monies were transferred. You know, I don't have access to their bank account, so we're not seeing that. But we, what I want from this particular section, right, is for you guys to understand the environment in which these individuals acted, right, and the relationships they've built in order to uh, collude and, 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 and commit uh, fraudulent behavior. Okay, so this is the most important uh, piece I want from you guys to understand. All right, so let's get going. So in 2012, let's understand what the Buffalo Billion Investment Development Plan was. Okay, so in 2012, Governor Andrew Cuomo announced the Buffalo Billion Investment Development Plan. All right, uh, this plan, though, was not necessarily his idea. Okay, it was based on the Western New York uh, Regional Economic Development Council's economic strategy right, known as, uh, it says here, a strategy for prosperity, okay? This particular plan had won several awards, I think, in 2011 and, ag and again in 2014, okay? But by 2011, Andrew Cuomo was going to be, uh, he had won the election, right, and, he, and he's stepping into office. And by then, he is inspired by this idea uh, that was created by uh, WNY Red Sea, okay? So, of course, uh, this particular plan is of interest, and he appoints these three creators, right? The Brookings Institute, uh, McKinsey and Company, and then the University at Albany and Regional Institute, okay? And the purpose, of course, was to attract private sector investment and creation of sustainable jobs based on the model that had success successfully turned Albany 
into the worldwide leader of nanotechnology, R&D, and advanced manufacturing. So first day in office, we are saying, let's go big or go home, right? Let's get this, let's get, you know, Western New York economic spark, right? But of course, as you know, and those of you who lived in Albany, Albany is not an overnight success, right? I was born and raised for 30, 30 years I was there, 20, 20, 30 years I was there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I remember that first CNCE building going up right on Fuller Road. Okay, so it was not It was a long time coming and uh, it's a, an amazing success story as well. But let's just look at how the Buffalo Billion would have affected or is affecting uh, Western New York. So the way they originally budgeted, okay, was that Solar City was receiving seven hundred and fifty million dollars? Okay, so let's look. Uh, let me just look at this for a second. So the implementation process stated though that the majority of these Buffalo Billion projects are not direct investment to individual companies. No, but they are stra strategic investments in state assets instead that will ultimately attract private investments. Right. So the the goal here is to have uh, state funds create the facilities and start the initiation of these great projects, right? But we want outside third third parties to come and invest more money, right? So, a, for instance, here is looking at Solar City line one here. The idea here was to provide Solar City with three hundred and fifty million dollars in um, the Buffalo Billion investment, right? Three hundred fifty million dollars, one hundred fifty million dollars in tax credits. And $250 million in other state funding, right? Just to develop the facility. All right. So $750 million was just the initial investment for this entity. The expectation, though, of Solar City itself was to invest $5 billion into this region with the foresight of creating $3,000, 3,000 permanent jobs uh, in the Buffalo area and then another 2,000 jobs elsewhere in the state. All right, so there was an ex a greater expectation on, on Solar City, okay, with the initial investment of seven hundred fifty million dollars. All right, so let's talk a little bit about their implementation plan because it does seem as though we had proper monitoring and oversight. But let's look at how this was was designed. Okay, so the governor's office created this great vision for Western New York, and it was going to be overseen by WNY Red Sea. All right, and they've identified three industry sectors and they also identified three core strategy areas. All right, so I recreated their implementation model to be a little bit more robust. All right, and for our case study in a few slides, we're mainly looking over here at the left health and life services and advanced manufacturing. Both of these were under the authority and review of CNCE, right? Currently now SUNY Poly. Um, let's go back. So you can see here, um, I redid the numbers for us to understand what amount of money went into each of these sectors, okay, or core areas. So looking at the top here, we have our bottom here, $836.3 million alone in the health and life sciences sector. And then we had $170 million in advanced manufacturing. Now, I point this out for us because if you look at the numbers, OK, oftentimes criminals, fraudsters assume that their fraudulent acts are very immaterial to the actual total. So if we're looking at a billion dollars, what's five hundred thousand dollars of missing money? Right. This is a rationalization process in their minds. And that's something to uh, to think about. OK. But by 2014, let's look again. This wasn't a bad idea. This was a great idea to spark. Uh, economic development in Western New York. So between 2011, from the announcement of the uh, Buffalo Billion uh, plan to 2014, they s they had seen an increase about 7,516 jobs. That's great. Uh, total wages had increased about 1.9 billion in the in this area, and then further, the new new investment and and businesses increased by 1,103. So clearly, with the exception of these few bad actors. The Buffalo Billion was actually a great plan because it started to spark the economy very well. OK, but it got a bad name because, again, a very immaterial amount of individuals uh, caused some damage. OK, and that's that's when we come to the next slide. OK, 
So here are the schemes and that this is how we're going to focus on them. So at the bottom here, we're going to look at the Prococo bribery, right? Stage one. We'll get into the Kelly extortion. We'll go into COR development and right at the top, the scheme of all schemes, the Buffalo Billion. Okay. But what we're going to notice in the first three schemes as we review them is that we have to note the environment in which they're in, right? How communication occurred? What was the process of each scheme? And are they even similar, right? Excuse me. So not all schemes reviewed are directly related to the Buffalo Billion, but they lead into the exploitation of millions of dollars in contracts being unethically diverted to vendors, okay? So... Finally, these schemes lead to corruption, all right, to grow and expand into the Buffalo Billion bid rigging scheme. All right, and what we're going to look at in the following, right, off to the right, we bring back our idea, right, of the environment. Okay, you will see as briefly each stage of corruption within the pyramid that the environment grows and cultivates the acceptance of this bad behavior. So as each scheme occurs, they become more confident, more emboldened into continuing this process and the way they're conducting business and decision making. Okay, so it continues the, the dominoes. Okay, so we have to look at key players. All okay, right, before we begin into the case study. All right, so Joseph Percoco Herb, okay, was the top aide. All right, was a secretary deputy to Andrew Cuomo. All right, we have Elaine Calleras, also a top aide. Uh, to the governor and ex-president of SUNY Poly. And Todd Howe, okay, the one of the bigger players here, actually, and you'll learn why in a second, but he, the former, he was a former lobbyist with a well-known firm based in Albany and Washington, D.C. And uh, without naming names, okay, he called his shell company uh, a similar name to Disguise Payments, um, which I believe was WOH. And I call him the middleman because he facilitated and was the intermediary for all discussions and scandalous agreements that had occurred. He's probably smiling in this photo, though, because he was the only one or the first one to cooperate with the FBI and had admitted guilt. So he may have gone off a little bit easier than he than he should have. OK. Other key players now, instead of government officials, were also looking at vendors. Right. So this is Peter Galbraith. Kelly Jr. Um, in the documents, he's known as Braith. Okay. Let me. So he was actually an executive of CPV Energy, an energy company during this time uh, that relied heavily on government intervention and action, mainly the involvement of Joseph Percoco, who you saw in the previous slide, to influence and persuade decisions on behalf of CPV Energy and to set up meetings to further benefit CPV Energy. All right. Then we have core development. All right. We have Joseph Girardi, who was counsel for, for core development, and Stephen Aiello, CEO. All right. We have also LP Simonelli, another construction company. All right. So we have Louis Simonelli, uh, Kevin Schuler, and Michael Lapel. All right. Were the executives LP Simonelli, um, which was a construction company in Western New York vying to win bids and obtain construction contracts. They shut down their doors in 2017, of course, uh, once the headlines made the paper and arrests were made. So let's get into scheme one. Who is a part of scheme one? We have Joseph, Todd Howe, and Peter Galbraith. All right. So here we have to understand what roles each individual played, right? Joseph Percoco, obviously being the government official with influence and power, had the ability to manipulate and change decisions, right? Todd Howe was acting as agent to Percoco and middleman for the bribery and corruption communications. Peter was an executive of CPV Energy seeking to benefit his company with awarded agreements and winning bids using his consultant, right, Todd Howe. So these are their roles. You know, it's almost as if we're reading into a script, okay? So this slide really does sugarcoat the scheme a bit, but it is generally the high level of how communication worked in this scheme. It was designed so that Percoco never directly spoke with anyone that he was obtaining bribes from. So at the top, we begin with Braith, right? Who initiates communication and payments to house Shell LLC and apparently was paid by CPV Energy for false consulting services. 
So by keeping payments flowing regularly to House Shell LLC as consulting payments, Braith was able to pressure upward, right, to Howe and indirectly to Prococo for official agent action. All right, so as Howe was receiving payments, he then communicated uh, to CPV energy needs to Prococo and requested interference on issues and influence in decisions. Okay, so this caused CPV energy to benefit on deals. Yo, um, all right, real quick. Um, so I'm looking at this thing, right? That you sent over here. Uh, I'm sorry, could you, if there's a question, could you please leave it towards the end or right into the chat box? I'm trying to get it to match up to these through assignment sheets where I, where I put all their numbers down. Um, some kind of makes sense. Other ones, I. Like I don't think I'm he's sorry, talking you, to you, us. He's on the phone. So no, no, it's, okay. Could it's mute okay. I mute. I, it's okay, Felipe. I muted you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I muted him. He's fine. I understand. I thought it was for us. All right, let's move on. So anyway, like I was mentioning, so this caused CPV energy to benefit on deals, but also instead allowed Percoco and how to extort CPV energy and trade <laughs> along the way. Okay. So. Of course, we know how the scheme looks, right? But let's look at the process, right? So I, I, I illustrate it just a little bit further for everybody here. Okay, so let's look at the actual process and bribes obtained. Okay, starting at the top, of course, we have Percoco, uh, who made promises to Braith or CPV Energy to assist him and CPV Energy in obtaining the power purchase agreement and the reciprocity agreements, okay? Okay, these would be a value of over about $100 million for CPV. But in turn, Percoco adamantly requested from Braith to have CPV Energy hire his wife. Why? Because as we will see in later slides, Percoco had several of the vulnerability ingredients that we've discussed, okay, um, that we've discussed within his working environment. So Percoco's wife was then hired at approximately $90,000 a year for three years, which is obviously $270,000. And he enjoyed various benefits, of course, from CPV energy, uh, such as free meals, fishing trips, and he even had access to CPV's um, private jet, okay? So you will see that though, uh, it was actually taught how, you will see through the next slides and the other schemes that it's actually taught how, who often became the breadwinner in each of these situations, as he was able to charge fake consulting fees to his shell company. And here it was calculated that CPV Energy paid consulting fees totaling about $474,000, right? And his promise to them was he'll continue to talk with Percoco and have access to the governor, okay? So what were Percoco's actions? So in the next five or six slides, okay, We'll see these communications and how the individuals cultivated the environment that accepted fraudulent and unethical behavior. But these were the promises and actions taken by Percoco to continue the fraud. Okay, so Percoco utilized his position to facilitate meetings for the energy company, right? He created meetings, um, you know, with other top leading uh, officials, those individuals that had uh, influence over decisions being made on whether agreements were to be facil facilitated and agreed upon or whether someone won a bid, okay? So he created these meetings also to create the optics of trust, and we'll get into that as well. Second, he assisted CPV Energy in obtaining lower cost emission credits in New York in New York for a plant to be built in New Jersey. You're wondering why did he do it in New York versus New Jersey? In New York, it was actually cheaper, right, to purchase these uh, emission credits than it was to be conducting the same issue in New Jersey, right? And so this was called the reciprocity agreement. Finally, uh, Percoco promised Braith via how, Todd how, uh, Braith CPV Energy to assist in obtaining and winning the power purchase agreement, right? So he, so these were his three actions that were apparently cost only $35,000, okay? So let's look at this, right? We have to come back to our vulnerability ingredients and our environment, right? And I want you guys to, again, understand what's happening behind the scenes, right? We see the headlines, we understand corruption occurred, but what, what were the discussions that were had? And I think that the complaint and the filing, doc, document filings, if you read them, are very, very um, uh, educational, okay? So it says here, all right, on September 11, 2012, Percoco wrote an email to House stating, Herb, nail down that situation, happy to have dinner or meet with you guys anytime. 
thanks. According to Hal, nailed down meant this was to obtain a job for Percoco's wife. Okay, why? Well, here are the financial pressures, right? Percoco purchased a house uh, for about $800,000 in Westchester, uh, which caused him additional financial strain. Okay, and the next communication, he says, need to try and hammer something out for JP. So how is speaking with Kelly at this time of CPV Energy? Okay, and he says, wants you and I to try and identify something he wants to try, something, uh, identify something. He wants to try and stay removed if possible, if you know what I mean. So now Todd is saying to Kelly, hey, you need to hire, hire Prococo's wife, but also when you do, try to keep his name out of it, okay, or her name as well. So how is pressuring Drake to hire the wife? Right. And then disguise the conflict of interest. OK. And finally, in this last bit here, to finalize the hiring of 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 the wife, he says, "Er, need to pull the trigger on this. So this is Percoco saying to Todd how we need to pull the trigger on this. Things are getting bad. So he's really feeling the financial pressure now of purchasing this home. His wife no longer has her job. She quit uh, a New York City teaching position. So now you have issues happening. OK financial stress. Okay, let's continue. There are more casual conversations occurring though, right? So can you see? Oh, so can you, sorry, I looked at the chat box. So you can see now that they're setting up this, you know, comfortable, relaxed situation and environment to cultivate bribery and corruption, right? So in a follow-up email, how confirmed that boy locked and loaded Thursday night at the estate. Okay. Percoco replied, is he bringing the check? LOL. Right. So now it's very friendly. Everything is great, you know, and it's described that Galbraith Jr. or Braith was, quote unquote, fat man. Right. So they're name calling and how later wrote herb needs seven thousand five hundred boxes of ZD. OK, per, per Coco responds. Yes, yeah, seven thousand five hundred a month was her old salary. So clearly he here he's not hiding anything. Right. He specifically says seven thousand five hundred dollars is her old salary. So. Let's let's step back for a second. What is the environment that they're creating here? So I, I wrote these down for you guys. There's casual joking of bribery and extortion, right? They're laughing at jokes and being able to receive money. OK, they're name calling other individuals involved in the in the bribe, maybe like as if they were puppets, right? They are just tools or pawns in their game, right? They don't hide the fact he for Coco doesn't hide the fact that he's requesting seven thousand five hundred dollars a month right for his wife all right and they're also using terms it says here the word zd right they're using words from the sopranos right so they're romanticizing criminal activity okay as if this is fun okay so you can see and and witness obviously right this environment that they're creating so let's go further right so I call this the beginning of the end. In this excerpt, though, it brings us to the beginning of the end for obtaining benefits from CPV energy. Knowing this, Prococo knew he could at best continue to extort CPV energy for about another 20 months. So let's read this particular part. So after Prococo, you know, attempts to influence other uh, officials, right, to provide them with the, PPP, uh, the PPA, right, this particular uh assistant secretary did the right thing right so the former energy assistant secretary advised percoco that the energy company was unlikely to be awarded a ppa why because there were other projects that were viewed as more favorable by review by the reviewing committee okay so the the, the reviewing committee and the secretary did not play into the urgency or the pressure of percoco so we have to give credit to this individual. I did not find her name or his name, but um, we have to give credit where credit is due, of course. So the former energy assistant further said and also explained that what he told Percoco was confidential information to which the energy company did not have access to. And in fact, the energy company's application for the PPA remained pending for at least another 20 months. So CPV Energy would not know the decision for another 20 months, right? So knowing that information, right, communication to uh, Percoco was confidential. He was not obligated to divulge that information to Braith or CPV Energy, but instead he used this knowledge 
right, to continue to now extort. We went from bribery to now extortion. Uh, and he continued to receive payment, right? So the extortion now begins. It's no longer bribery. So to the contrary, and I'll read this as well. To the contrary, Percoco and Howe decided to continue to assure Kelly. So now Todd also knows that they're not going to win the PPA, but they're going to continue the story as if they are. So Percoco and Howe decided to continue to assure Kelly that Percoco was using his official position and influence to help the energy company obtain a PPA so that the energy company would continue to make payments to, bo to both Percoco's wife and to how through his LLC. All right. So in order to maintain this illusion, Prococo arranges several meetings in 2014 and 2015, right? I mentioned this before. So he creates this illusion of trust that he's performing official acts and he's facilitating meetings to make sure that Kelly or Braith is comfortable and confident that they are working on their side to get the PPA approved. So again, I write here, building the optics of trust and ensuring meetings would be fruitful, right? So what do we see here? Let's go back to our environment or our vulnerability ingredients, right? We see there's a position of influence, right? So he's facilitating meetings with individuals he has no connection with, but he's still able to do that because of his position and power and title, right? There are trust components here. People just trust that he's going to do what he has to do. And then there's the financial pressures right now to keep the money flowing from CPV energy and Braith. So instead of stopping the bribery, they now move into extortion and play the game of lies. All right, so I, I go into more continued extortion, but so at this point, we should also be thinking, how is any of this going unchecked, unmonitored or unknown, right? And if this behavior was known by someone, why were there no whistleblowers? Does the environment, so the question is then, does the environment hinder the bravery of whistleblowers or at best individuals to halt these corrupt requests and actions? So if we look at the behavior of this of the of the energy uh, secretary, that person did a good job by saying, you know what? I spoke with the uh, the council. They said they're going to go a different direction. So despite having some pressure by Prococo, they denied that pressure and influence. So that was great. Right. But let's go. Let's just read a little bit more about the environment, right? How they how they went about talking about this extortion. How replies, good man, Herb. Thanks. Concerned as the PSC is supposed to hold a meeting on third this Thursday, so hold the NYPA's president uh, believes something will come out of this. Okay, hold the former state operations director's feet to the fire. Okay, so so he's trying to ensure that Percoco pushes more pressure on the uh, deciding individuals, okay? So let's just move on. So now let's go back to our graphic. How does this, how did this turn into extortion? Okay, we have to look at this graphic and say, well, you know what, now we're canceling these promises. The promises don't actually occur because we know internally, right? We have confidential information. We know that CPV is not gonna obtain the, P, the PPA. So we replace this with greater lies, okay? So finally, Kelly realizes that after three years of communications with Todd Howe and payments being made, that the PPA would most likely not be rewarded, right? And this ruse was going to uh, was going nowhere. So payments stopped in around January 2016. So scheme one really sets the stage for Prococo and Todd Howe to continue their corrupt behavior. Okay, so again, we're realizing environment plays a really big role here. So, as I was reading, I noticed a particular control failure, right, or a question that we have to bring up, right? So, there are financial disclosure statements, right? Officials are required to file on an annual statement, uh, an annual statement of financial disclosure with New York State Joint Commission on Public Ethics, right? So, they're re required to disclose outside income activities, finances, and assets that may indicate financial impropriety or conflicts of interest, right? But the problem is with these with these types of applications is they often go unconfirmed, right? So Percoco did not in these instances disclose any of the payments made from CPV Energy. Okay, so what was the failure? Documents are essentially taken at face value with no additional oversight or verification process. 
Again, this is because of confirmation bias, right? We assume that our elected officials are being honest and we use this purely, this, we use this step purely as a documentary phase, right? So when we do detect fraud, we can go back and check these documents and say, well, you never told us that you had these payments coming in from a third party that we're heavily invested with. All right, so this is a particular issue that we need to look at and say, how can we improve? There's always room for improvement. What additional steps can we take to verify that the financial disclosures are in fact what they are? But that's for, of course, a later discussion. Okay, and now let's review scheme one a little bit, right? So we had Percoco's environment, okay? So he was in a position of influence, right? That from what we've read has barely any you know, no oversight or monitoring of his actions or communications, right? We had financial pressures that occurred, right? He had $800,000 in a new mortgage in Westchester County that he couldn't afford at the time. Uh, Percoco's wife had left her job, so that decreased the monthly payments to about $8,594, while his debts monthly were about $20,000. So obviously this is an unsustainable financial situation here. What about undisclosed conflicts of interest, right? He was college friends with Todd Howe, and he became friendly with Elaine Calleros, Peter Galbraith Kelly, and also calling Aiello and Girardi friends in later. So failed to disclose outside payments, right? That's another undisclosed conflict of interest. What about political motives? So the achievements and success of the deals not only credited Andrew Cuomo, but the influence also credited credit goes towards, you know, per Coco as well as he was the deal maker. Okay. And finally, trust. He was a selected, in, a selected individual of Andrew Cuomo and had a, and appeared to be, you know, had significant weight and influence across the government entities. So when you were reading this, we see he does have this influence and this power to influence other people's decision, maybe because he was respected, or maybe there was that element of trust. So let's go into scheme two, and I'll try to speed it up just a little bit more, okay? So now we know that financial pressures continued to mount for Prococo. We, we know that for, for a fact. And, knowing, and now he knows that CPV Energy will eventually stop paying Todd Howe, and they will eventually fire his wife. So what happens? Prococo goes to Todd Howe and says, well, why don't we look at your other clients and see how we can help your other clients? And Todd Howe identifies Stephen Aiello and Joseph Girardi of core development as the next victims of their bribery and corruption ring. Okay. So what happens here, okay, is that they approach these two individuals. All right. And while the scheme itself stays the same, that circle that we saw, the communication process and how money flowed, while the scheme itself actually stays the same, right? Todd would act as the intermediary in most instances and facilitate payments to Percoco all while Percoco attempts to be disguised and masked, right? But nonetheless, Percoco again takes official action to influence the business decisions and influence of other government officials on behalf of core development, okay? So in this particular slide, we see uh, $35,000 going to House LLC, and then, and then over time on two separate dates going instead to Percoco's wife. So, while Percoco's wife was also hired at CPV, she was also dragged into this particular scheme where Howe would pay her instead of Joseph, right? Just another way of masking payments and that Percoco had no involvement, right? But in turn, Percoco would provide LPA influence, right? This was a, um, a labor union uh, issue, okay? And then he also assisted in releasing 14 millions of state funds uh, that were related directly to the Buffalo billion, okay? So let's look a little bit more as how it all started, okay? So it says, on or about January 15, 2014, Percoco and Howe were scheduled to meet with Stephen Aiello, the defendant, at the governor's office in New York. So now here we are creating a, um, you know, an optics of trust, right? A, an importance situation here where, wow, I'm going to the governor's office. This is going to be great. I'm rubbing elbows and I'm networking, right? And then Percoco, you know, again, jokingly says, I may pull Governor and Herbert in to say hello to him if they are still here. Howes just simply says, well, that would be great, worth, worth the extra credit of ZD, right? So worth more money if you can just, you know, have Stephen Aiello and Joseph Girardi meet the governor and feel important, right? So they're setting up these optics of trust 
influence and power, right? So they're in these positions. Finally, you have how had also suggested to Aiello, right? Suggested to Aiello that Percoco might eventually seek Aiello's advice, right? About Syracuse region and connection with the governor's upcoming re-election campaign, right? So Percoco, however, responded only if that other thing happens, right? I will advise them on how to play a role and be relevant. So what does this mean, right? So there, he's making a need for Aiello as if there were no other construction companies in Syracuse or Buffalo that could be experts on particular matters, right? He's saying he wants to speak directly to Aiello. So now Aiello feels important, right? And now is a part of this ring and friendship, okay? And they're also now going to request payment. So the other thing that he's speaking about is payment. So what were his actions? Again, again, because the scheme stayed the same, okay? And the process was quite similar. Core development would, through the intermediary of Todd Howe, pay out to either Percoco or his wife, indirectly or directly. So what do we see here? What actions? He assisted in overturning the LPA. This is the labor peace agreement decision to speed up construction uh, on items related to the Buffalo Billion. He also assisted in the release of $14 million of funds dedicated to core development, uh, which was also part of the Buffalo Billion. And then he and then lastly, which I didn't mention, but he obtained a raise for Stephen Aiello's son, who also worked uh, for government. Okay, so I'm going to go through this a little bit more faster, but what you have to see here is now we have two separate situations where the scheme and the process has stayed the same. Okay, so finally we're getting to the scheme three, the Buffalo uh, bid rigging process. Okay. And I'm going to go through this quite quickly because, again, we see that this stays the same. The scheme itself stays the same. It's just that now we have a more complex and larger group. We're all coming together. We have Percoco, we have Aiello, we have LP Simonelli, and we have uh, Todd Howe, all right? And Elaine Colleros, which is not depicted here, actually. So we have everybody now finally doing what they wanted to do, okay? So as part of this scheme, and this is a perfect example here, the Syracuse developer, right, and the Buffalo developer, so both LP Simonelli and Core Development, paid bribes to Howe, which were purported to be consultancy payments, right, and bonuses, but which were in fact payments for Howe's actions in the capacity as agent, right, and representative of CNCE, SUNY Poly, right, and the Research Foundation, who had, along with Elaine Calieros, the defendant, had substantial control over Fort Schuyler state funded development project, right? So again, I hate to repeat myself, but we are now in positions of power with significant influence over decision and authority, right? So what I'm seeing and what we should be seeing is that there's no overarching monitoring situation or council to oversee other decision-making processes, okay? Instead, we see influence being pushed forth, okay? So here, Calieros, right, was attempting to defraud Fort Schuyler by secretly rigging the bids for large development deals so that they went to Syracuse developer and the Buffalo developer. Okay, so now let's step back. Now that we went through all the controls and understanding how bid rigging happens, what is happening here, right? We are having a specification scheme happening in front of our eyes, okay? This is cookie cutter, right? We know that there's a, we know core development and how they are shaped, and we know there's LP Simonelli and how they are shaped. So we're going to create these RFPs now to be purely cookie cutter. You know, nobody else could win them except for these two because they fit every requirement on the RFP. Right? So what are the significant events of this particular scheme, right? So Calieros first hires how to be an agent and representative of CNCE. Okay. Calieros was nervous about his position right, as president of CNCE, right? So at the time he was making approximately $800,000 per year, as well as an additional $500,000 through other grants and funding. So of course, Elaine was pressured here to keep his position. He's making a significant amount of money, $1.3 million annually, uh, just to be the president, right? And he's worried that he's going to lose this position. So he hires Todd Howe, to influence the governor or those top aides to keep his position and to be able to run SUNY Poly when they emerge, when the merger uh, happens, right? 
So moving on, Core and LPC then bribe Howe for his assistance in obtaining state contracts, right? Because now that Buffalo Billion had been announced, we can now look into obtaining those funds and projects. Calieros and Howe effectively draw up these fraudulent RFPs. Now, you have these two individuals. Howe is hired. Um, I'll get to that, actually. Howe is hired and receives about $25,000 per month from 2012 to 2015 for about two to three years, okay? At a salary and at a salary of $300,000, right? Specifically for influencing other top A's that he had connections with, okay? So Fort Schuyler unknowingly then awards these contracts to CORE and LP, Simone, LP Simonelli through rig bids, okay? So at every step of the way, acting as the intermediary we actually see Todd Howe was the facilitator of these connections. Otherwise, this whole thing would have broken down and, and would not have worked properly, right? I believe, me personally, that without Todd Howe, the, this house of cards would have fallen much earlier, okay? Let's look at how this worked out, though. Let's look again at this process, all right? And we're coming up shortly on our two hours. I wanna leave some time for questions as well, um, but let's just look here, okay? So let's step back and understand that in the entirety of the schemes presented today in this instance, it's actually Todd Howe, okay? And if we look at the, look, just look purely here. So we had Elaine Calayeros, right? The president of CNCE uh, providing $25,000 a month to Howe Shell LLC as a salary. So that's $300,000 or so. You have core development over here on the right also hiring at $14,000 a month for consultancy fees for official acts on behalf of Percoco, the governor, and those with Elaine Calieros, okay? Not only that, CORE also then gives $385,000 worth of bonuses in 2014 alone when the bid was won by CORE development. So when the bid was won, they gave him $385,000. That should indicate to you guys that the, that the contract itself was far greater than $385,000, okay? So he received $250,000 directly, right? And that's identified through his bank statements, right? And, and, and cash checks. And then he received another $135,000 to his Shell LLC, which was named after his, his actual place of employment, all right? And then we have LP Simonelli, right? Modestly giving another $100,000 a year to how for the same same practices, okay? So let's break this down and we'll get into the last bit here as we're coming up on our two hour mark. We have bribery, right? Let's look at the damages then. So CNCE, 300,000, core annual payments of 168, core bonuses to Todd Howe, 385, and LPC of $100,000, right? So your grand total of course is $953,000. But wait, scheme one, Let's go back to scheme one. This does not include $475,000 received in consulting fees by CPV Energy. So now, you know, just doing a little bit of math, we're at about, uh, you know, whatever, $1.4, $1.5 million here. All right. So finally, pulling question number five, and then we'll get into questions and uh, contact information. All right. So let's, let's, we're coming up on five minutes or so. All right. So this individual, collected consulting services fees, bribes, and behalf of government officials. Please, in the chat box, give me your answers. Yeah. The takeaway here for everybody is that it takes a team. I hate to say it like this, <laughs> like it's a team effort, but it's a team effort, right, to create this environment of, of, of creating uh, fraudulent behavior activity, cultivating the acceptance of it. It's literally a team effort, right? But there's always a pinnacle, right? There's always a, I would say a fulcrum that we could break and the whole thing would collapse, right? Todd Howe in this particular instance was that intermediary, was the facilitator. Now, could Percoco and the others have found another facilitator, someone who could be a part of these schemes? Maybe, maybe there's quite a lot of individuals like Todd Howe out there. But were they, would they have been effective, right? We don't know. But let alone with Todd Howe, this scheme could have been broken down a little bit faster, okay? So of course, 
your answer is here, D. Todd Howe. So, guys, uh, you know, my final thoughts here, you know, as you can see, bribery and corruption is never going to go away entirely. Uh, it's just going to continue happening. Um, so thank you guys so much. But, you know, uh, you know, we have to give credit to the white hats, people that push back on on bribery and corruption are not influenced by other individuals. Um, we have to really put ourselves as individuals as well, consider ourselves as individuals and apart from other uh, influences of power. I think going with that mindset, you can identify more easily red flags, right? Because even if you trust someone, if you like someone, that trust can manipulate your decision-making. And so I, I, I highly recommend that if you're a part of government or if you're an internal auditor to, a, to just stay uh, true, right? The numbers don't lie, people do. So if you repeat this mantra, right, my trademark, the numbers are like people do. So finally, final polling questions. I want to know from you, number six, which one would you love to hear about next? Okay. Um, so yes, PPP, that's right. All right. Well, I'm a PPP fan. This will also help us learn more about the the, the failures of how the rollout of PPP occurred um, during 2020, 2021. There were a lot of weaknesses in that initial rollout that caused massive corruption and fraud. And finally, here's my contact information. Uh, you can QR scan it. I have my email here at the bottom. Um, I would love to entertain any questions. I see a lot of you have uh, probably jumped out, you know, of um, <laughs> of the call. But nonetheless, uh, here's my contact information. So I appreciate you all. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Um, it was a sincere pleasure to go through this case study with you. And I hope uh, it was a good introduction. Yeah. I hope it was a good introduction for some of you. I also hope um, there's only, all right, I think we're almost done here. All right, if you have any questions, otherwise, you know, have a wonderful weekend um, and thank you again. I will awkwardly sit here <laughs> and wait for questions. <laughs> Lana, thank you. Well, on behalf of NYSICA and, and of everyone on Marlon, thank you so much. That was, that was great. Um, really enjoyed that. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you. Um, to, uh, to all attendees, uh, thank you for, for coming today. Like I said, probably be about two to three weeks, three weeks uh, to get the CPEs issued. Also, keep an eye out. Um, June of this year, uh, we'll be having our, our um, we've moved around our the timing of the spring conference. It'll be in June now, uh, and that'll be in New York City. So keep some, uh, keep eyes open for that. Um, oh, Marlon, I did see one question there. Um, yeah, I do see. So that's actually a great question. So the way in which they got caught, I believe was indeed someone did whistle blow. I did not cover it in these slides. The main focus here, though, for me uh, with this case study, so that you understand the environment that cultivated these actions. Okay. The downfall, of course, was identifying that these that these relationships did exist. So we can safely assume, of course, that there was a whistleblower or someone who began to investigate, right? That caught the attention of the FBI, right? If you know, I did not mention, but the first investigators was part of the FBI. So there definitely may most likely was in a whistleblower. Thank you for the question. All right, thank you. Um, okay, and we'll just wrap it up here. With the Buffalo Billion, is that why they ask for more disclosure for elected officials now? You know, it's it's interesting. Anytime you see a fraud be brought to light, right, there's always going to be more pressure for us as government officials and people to improve upon our processes. So we're never going to be perfect right but yes you could assume you could safely assume that with these events occurring you will see more requirements of polit po politicians and agents to be more um transparent with their financials project sunlight i'm going to look into this thank you suzanne all right all right. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you again. Uh, please contact me. 
uh, for further information. I really appreciate it, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.